inside of that pair with a half mile left to run. And Big Creek still well clear. Now it's about seven or eight. Sink along the inside, trying to make some headway in second. Climb to Glory is next. One particular harbor has a dozen to make up, and then Mongolian bonus. The field's approaching the quarter pole, and it's still Big Creek all alone. Now one particular harbor closing the gap, the lead down to five lengths and shrinking with every stride. Big Creek, one particular harbor within a length and a half now as they come to the eighth pole, and it's one particular harbor blowing right by Big Creek. Climb to glory is finishing, honestly enough. But one particular harbor has built up a three-length lead with a 16th to go. Climb to glory within two. One particular harbor. Climb to glory. It's going to get close. One particular harbor held on by a net. Climb to glory second, then Mongolian bonus and sink. They're in the gate. And they're off. Warrior's Moon broke out very quickly, looking so lucky, tail on the inside. Unusual Ride is three off the pace, and the heavy favorite Viazar tugging at the back of the field. Into the first turn. And it's looking so lucky with a narrow lead as they slow things down on the front end. Warriors Moon second, Ted at the rail in third. Unusual ride and a tad tight in between horses and a three wide Viazar. Three lengths covers the field. They swing on to the back stretch and it's looking so lucky, prompted by Warriors Moon. Two more Viazar sharing third, still under a hold. Ted is at the rail. Unusual ride between those two. Still compact. Field heads to the half mile pole. Looking so lucky. Warrior's Moon is a half length back in second. Two more Viazar. Tayet hugs the rail. Unusual Ride is now by herself at the back of the field. Looking so lucky has been the controlling speed with Warrior's Moon right next to her in second. Two more Tayet Viazar together. And now Unusual Ride will go outside of that pair and try and commence a rally. It's looking so lucky. Viazar is now called on on the outside. Warriors Moon in between them. They're a furlong from the finish. Warriors Moon, Viazar, back of the field, unusual ride. Down at the rail, looking so lucky, not done either. It's Warriors Moon, Viazar, Viazar on the outside. Here's the line. Viazar wins it by a neck as a heavy favorite. Warriors Moon, Ted, an unusual ride in a show photo. They're in the gate. And they're off. Even start. Run anti T run is out quickly. So is Niff on the extreme outside. One fine day comes through quicker than both and takes the lead. Sangre Azul falls back early. Down the back stretch. It's one fine day. A half length to run anti T run. A length and a half. Niff three wide third. Seven more. Back to Sangre Azul. Around the far turn, three across the track. One fine day at the rail. Niff now presses hard on the outside, and Niff takes the lead pretty easily. Opens up a half a length coming toward the quarter pole. Sangre Azul is starting to roll from behind under urging. Niff the one to beat a quarter of a mile from home. Opens up three. Sangre Azul takes up the chase. Run anti T run and one fine day. Drops back there coming to the eighth pole, and it's Niff with a three-length lead. Sangre Azul chasing gamely, trying to eat up that ground in the final 16th of a mile. Amy goes to work on Niff, trying to fend off Sangre Azul, who keeps on coming. Sangre Azul has the momentum. Sangre Azul from far back to win it under Tyler Bays. Niff second. Run anti T run. One fine day.
7.27. In the fifth, scratch 3, 11, and 12. The they're in the gate. And they're off. Nichiren is going to the front. Dream Robber has some speed. Quantum Quest now takes second. Crossword is up and on the pace, too. They're followed by Muay Thai inside Sir Flatter. Another three back to Inch outside Warren's Candyman and Mi Macho at the back of proceedings. Down the back stretch they go, and it's Nichiren just in front. Quantum Quest second. Two more. Dream Robber on the outside, a close up third. Crossword at the rail under an ice hold in fourth, has three lengths to make up. It's another four back to Muay Thai, joined by Sir Flatter, a length and a half to Inch, then a gap to the two trailers, Warren's Candyman and Me Macho. They have a quarter of a mile to go. Nichiren has been doing battle with Quantum Quest throughout. Just behind them, Crossword tipping off the rail, and then Dream Robber in fourth. They're followed by Muay Thai in the green. They're in the final furlong. Muay Thai angling to the far outside, and now starting a motorhome. Here's Muay Thai. Coming right at them, gobbling them up with a 16th of a mile to go under Flavian Pratt, who was confident throughout. Muay Thai jogs. Second to crossword. Third inch. Then it was Quantum Quest in front of Dream Robber. Distorted Queen goes in. They're in the gate. And they're off. Quick start for Manarelli, who will vie for the early lead alongside side by side. Distorted Queen and Snark didn't have a very good beginning, but now comes up to challenge for them right across the track onto the main course they go. And it's Manarelli leading it by just a head to snark along the inside, side by side. Distorted Queen, four deep, a length and a half, front to back. They're a half mile from home. And it's Manarelli and snark. Manarelli maintains a head lead, snark pressing from the inside, second. Side by side, loses a couple of ground, a couple of lengths in third. And then comes Distorted Queen. It's Manarelli strong on the front end. Opens up a length and a half now on Snark. Now it's two as they come to the quarter pole. Manarelli opening up willingly. Four length lead with a quarter of a mile to go. Snark could not keep pace in second. Fully extended at the top of the stretch. It's Manarelli and Edwin Maldonado romping home. Seven length lead and absolutely no dangers. Snark distorted queen and side by side to battle out the balance behind Manarelli, who comes into her own in career start number three, just trots in by almost 10. Snark second, distorted queen and side by side. Last one is Stella Noir. And they're off. That's Amare in the center of the course is out alertly. So is Carpe Fortuna, who's now up to take the lead. Miss Costa Rica is racing in between those two. They're joined at the rail by Honey Jar. And there's a real battle for the early lead. It's now Honey Jar coming through quickest of all to take a narrow lead as the field runs down the hill. Inner Beauty is on the outside in the red colors, and in between those two comes That's Amare battling it out as well. Carpe Fortuna is on the outside of them as they continue down the hill with Inner Beauty now taking the lead. It's Inner Beauty in front. Honey Jar is on the inside battling, as is Ultimate High, who's in the thick of it as well. Crossing the dirt and coming for home. And it's That's Amare prominent throughout, 
Honey Jar along the inside, battles on in the center of the course. Carpe Fortuna, Inner Beauty is now losing ground from the back of the field. Gleska Gal is getting involved. Extreme outside, Christie's Tiger. And in behind horses, Miss Costa Rica along with the gray. Ultimate high, it can't get any wilder than this. Stella Noir on the outside, taking the lead in the final stages. Here's Cologne, Stella Noir, Cologne. Stella Noir wins by a confident neck. Cologne second, ultimate high, Honey Jar, and then a battle involving Gleska Gal. Running time, 112.31. Eighth race kicks off the golden hour pick four. Post time in 23 minutes. They're in the gate. And they're off. Distracted Princess comes out smoothly. Eyes open, tries to press in the early stages. Trouville, Fifi, Faro, Lissette is at the back of the field. It's Distracted Princess to the seven furlong pole, racing a bit off the rail, but leading by about a half length. Eyes open is in second. Fifi, Faro on the inside of Trouville. Trouville clearly into third. And then it's Lissette at the back of a compact group, only about three and a half, covers them as they move on to the backstretch. And John Velasquez has the heavy favorite, Distracted Princess in control. Leading it by a half length, eyes open, still keeping pace in second. Trouville third. At the rail, Fifi Farrow comfortable enough in fourth, just three lengths off the lead with five eighths to travel. Another two back to Lisette. No change in the running order. They have now passed the half mile pole. It's Distracted Princess showing the way. Three quarters of a length. Eyes open second. Trouville outside of them in third. Fifi Ferro now four off the lead and has to pick it up. Same story for Lisette. They're approaching the quarter pole. Distracted Princess starts to edge away right now. And it's Distracted Princess suddenly two in front. Trouville takes second. Eyes open a tired third. Fifi Ferro hugs the rail. They're heading to the eighth pole. And Distracted Princess, very professional. Opens up four, Fee, Fee, Farrow finishing willingly along the inside and clearly into second, but no match for Distracted Princess who will pass the two-turn test with flying colors. Distracted Princess by a half dozen. Fee, Fee, Farrow, Trouville, Lissette. Distracted Princess was bred in Kentucky by Kudalaria. They're in the gate. And they're off. 34 Coop sprints out of the gate to take the lead. Lottery pick at the rail. Crosby Beach is close up too. Just behind them, it's Maynard in fourth, about three lengths off the speed. Down at the rail, Birth of Cool, who is followed by Pakoda, on the back of the field are Malibu Mayhem and quid pro quo Joe Blow. It's Crosby Beach who takes the lead from 34 Coop, has it by three quarters of a length. Lottery pick, a joint third, racing on the inside of Maynard, and they're followed by Pakota, who settles nicely in fifth, six lengths off the lead. Birth of Cool is down at the rail. It's a gap of four back to Malibu Mayhem and quid pro quo Joe Blow. Onto the back stretch they go, and Crosby Beach opens up about a length and a half. 34 Coop cuts right back into that margin. It's down to a neck. At the rail, lottery pick on hold third, and Maynard just outside of him. Pakota trying to make headway in between those two with a half mile left to run. A gap of three back to Birth of Cool, who's four in front of Malibu Mayhem and quid pro quo Joe Blow. Around the far turn, Crosby Beach a length, 34 Coop is in second. Lottery pick Maynard. Just behind them comes Pakota, who's racing in fifth, taking fourth with a quarter of a mile to go. 
Crosby Beach, lottery pick, 34 coupe outside of them. They're followed by Pakoda at the top of the stretch. Crosby Beach, 34 coupe, running a good one on the outside. And in between them, it's lottery pick, final furlong, and 34 coupe trying to get to Crosby Beach. Crosby Beach, 34 coupe, lottery pick is at the rail. Crosby Beach has been nicely handled throughout, and Crosby Beach wins. 34 coupe, a solid second. Birth of Cool, Pakoda, and...
You ever seen that show on ESPN, World Series of Poker? You probably have, even if you're not a poker player. They show people who are playing cards, seven-card stud, and actually one of them winds up winning close to $6 million. Well, guess what? This weekend at Bally's Las Vegas, and obviously Las Vegas, Nevada, 600 horse players are playing over the next three-day period in order to win $725,000. Whoever wins that tournament will be crowned champion and also win an Eclipse Award. Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Quigley, VIP player concierge, also your seminar host for the next 40 minutes. And our seminar guest today, he's been known to shuffle up and deal every now and then. I'll introduce him in just one moment. But before I do, best of luck to all the contest contestants at the National Handicapping Championship in Bally's Las Vegas. Also, best of luck to our seminar guest today. That's because the jockey he represents, Abel Cedillo, has six mounts on today's eight race card. That's why I decided to invite him on. His name, Tom Knutes. Tom, welcome to the seminar. Well, thank you. And don't forget, I have Victor Espinosa also, and he has one mount. We don't want to leave Victor out of the Come mix. On, he, yeah. uh, you know, he's a Kentucky Derby winning jockey. and yeah. uh, Triple crown winning triple, jockey. Triple crown um, winning jockey. Yeah. Let's talk about another jockey for a moment. I'm going to be a smart ass. And I never like to be a smart ass around you because I know you're a, you know, you're a former Marine. What was your opinion of Johnny V coming to the jockey colony? Oh, I just loved it. I just could not believe it that he was coming out here. I wish more guys would come out to California. I wish Rosario would come back. I wish Ortiz brothers would come out. Oh, I just love it. <laughs> now, all joking aside, you're no, good. No, he's a great jockey, he's a Hall of Fame jockey, and I think it helps the jockey colony having him here. It, it's, it's, it's good for us. It, it really, really does, Tom. Yeah. And, and the reason why I say that, all joking aside, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot because, like I said, I was worried you're going to throw something at me, is I looked up the statistics from last year at this point in time. And at this point in time last year, basically one month into the meet, Abel had five wins. So far, this meet, he has 12 wins. So I think the one thing you said, which is really important, is more competition actually steps up everybody's game, doesn't it? Yeah, and then last year we started slow, but we ended um, strong. And and this is a game, as you know, is streaks. So sometimes you do you you're you know winning really well, and everything you're riding is is right there. And other times, you know, I remember when Steve Cawthorn came out here, was one of the leading riders in the country. He was riding, hit, ridden, what affirmed, and and. Um, he was oh for he's like oh for 120. So it, it can happen. So but no, I think John Velasquez is a classy person, a great writer, and having him out here I think helps Southern California. And it certainly limits the opportunities you have to ride for Bob Baffert. But of course you do over the weekend. We're only going to talk about today's mounts, but you talked about jockeys who kind of came out here, tested the water, and then wound up going back east again. Trevor McCarthy, the latest example, he came out to Delmar. He didn't have that successful meet. He's winning races by a bunches back at Aqueducta during the winter. Yeah, it's it's like one of those things. He's a great rider and he's doing really good back there. And he was doing good before he came out here. It was just unfortunate. He just didn't get the mounts that, you know, he could get. And it wasn't his fault. And it wasn't Derek's fault. It was just the way things happen. What separates a Hall of Fame jockey like Johnny V or Flavian or Victor from a guy who's maybe in the top 10 standings but not in the Hall of Fame? Well, good horses. <laughs> that has a lot to do with it. But I mean, that's your job. You know, I. I had Pat Valenzuela's book for four different times, and he's somebody that will probably never be in the Hall of Fame. But if you talk to people, he'd be one of the top five jockeys that ever rode. Um, so, but I think it's just consistency. Good riders ride consistently well. You know, you have certain horses where one rider can win, and it didn't matter who was on the horse, and they could win it. But to be consistent, doing the right thing, making the right choices like Pratt does, you know, it, 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 it really helps. And that's what I like about Abel. Abel is very consistent. He, he does make the right choices. Unfortunately, sometimes I don't get him on the best horses, and, and that's my fault. What made Patrick such a, gate, such a great gate rider? Well, number one, he changed the whole race. When he was in there, all the jockeys had to change what they were planning on doing. So they'd see him in there. You never knew what he was going to do. He'd break, and then he could lay wherever he wanted to be, and then he'd make a move at the 3 8 pole. If you're behind him, you're not going to catch him, and if you're in front of him, he's going to go by you. So he was just a, a very smart rider, very strong rider, and um, he changed the game when he was riding. There were other good gate riders during that time period as well. A couple that come to mind are David Flores and Martin Pedroza. But Patrick was head and shoulders way better than them out of the gate. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. One guy that I always liked in the past years when he drew the one hole was Paco Mena. Mm -hmm. I never saw a guy get out of the one hole better than him. So most guys don't like to be in the one hole. But when Paco Mena was on a horse and he was in one hole, you could bet him because it didn't matter to him. So put you, put you in another tough position here, Tom, and there's no right answer, but it'll be interesting to see how you answer it. Is the best jockey you ever saw ride Shoemaker, Lafitte, or somebody else? 
Um, probably Abel Cedillo and Victor Espinosa. <laughs> You're you know, so politically correct. Oh, well, you know, Vince DeGregor got in trouble one time. They asked him, he had Chris McCarron's book, and they asked Vince, who's the best writer you've ever had? And he said, uh, Lafitte Pinkai. The next day he was fired. So you got to be careful when you say that. But I, I mean, Pen K was great. Shoemaker was great. You know, those guys are just, they're, they're unbelievable good writers and consistent in everything that they did. There's a bust of many of the people we're talking about in the walking ring here right at the paddock at the Great Race Place. And, of course, a couple of trainers who come to mind who I wanted to kind of get just a first impression from you, Tom, and you knew them both pretty well. Charlie Whittingham and Bobby Frankel. Yeah, well, they're both great trainers. The one thing, Bobby Frankel, I worked for him for a long time as a stable agent. And the one thing I noticed about him, and he told me, his best trait was he knew when to stop on a horse and when to let up on a horse. And Charlie, he just knew how to get a horse fit and ready to run, which is not easy to do. So he could have a horse laid off for six months and he could win going a mile and a quarter. So they both had their strengths, um, but uh, both of them Hall of Fame trainers. Tom had the opportunity to spend many mornings on the backside here at the Great Race Place. I only had the opportunity one time to spend a morning with Charlie Winningham. The one thing he told me that I took away, anybody can train a racehorse. A great trainer can, can get inside the mind of a racehorse. We're going to take a quick break, toss it over to track announcer Frank Miramati, get the early program changes on today's eight race card. When we return, we'll find out who Tom likes on today's card. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Santa Anita Park, the great race place. Here are the changes. Track is fast, turf is firm, rail on the turf out 30 feet for today's racing action. Just the blinker note in race one, start of the early pick five. Second race starts the early pick four. Just a blinker note. Rainbow pick six kicks off with race three. 206,000 in the jackpot pool for a single ticket winner. Jockey change, number two, Kate and Kid make it Juan Hernandez. Weight 126. Fourth race started the late pick five. No changes. Late pick four begins with race five. Scratch two, show it. Overweight, number four, discreet Stevie B, three over. In the sixth race, no changes. Seventh race starts the golden hour, pick four. Just the blinker note. Eighth race kicks off the golden hour, double. Just the blinker note. Enjoy your day at Santa Anita Park. At this time, we go back to Quigley's Corner. Today's special guest is Tom Knust.
Welcome back. We're talking horses with Tom Knutes. He's the jockey agent for both Abel Cedillo and Victor Espinoza. Victor has one mount on today's card. Abel has six. Hopefully he's a wealth of information on today's card, allowing you to cash some tickets. Tom, let's kick things off in race number one, which begins the popular 50 cent early pick five. We're sprinting six furlongs on the turf course. Maiden claiming three rolls in for a $50,000 tag. The rails today are at 30 feet. The morning line favorite and the current overwhelming betting choice is number two. Mow them down six to five on the morning line. Now one to five on the board going from a route to a sprint coming back quickly for your friend Doug O'Neill Flavian on board what do you think of uh, mow them down and also the uh, the horse you ride number six Abaddon well I never won I think that the speed in the race is the six and the two has speed and I think Pratt's gonna go but I think that um, Abel's horse has more speed and he's on the outside of that horse. So I'm gonna go for an upset here. Um, naturally this horse figures he, on his past performance and then having Pratt on people are going to bet him but I think they're going to over bet him so I'll go for a price and I'll go with a six horse and go wire to wire fair enough uh, Tom before we take a look at race number two Abaddon was last seen at Los Alamitos on December 4th number of workouts here at Sanita including two bullet works was able in the saddle for any of those morning works no what did Ryan tell you about Abaddon that you like the horse so much? Obviously, we see adding LASIK, second-time starter, a confident boost up in class, outside post. Are those some of the reasons why you like the horse who's right now, believe it or not, 7-1 to one on the tote board? Well, I like him because Abel's riding him. And I like him also. He has speed. And I really, um, Ryan Hansen does a really good job on horses. So when trainers, are certain trainers, if I don't have a call and like a Ryan Hansen calls me, um, or naturally, you know, Mark Ladd or sure. Mark Ladd or Doug O'Neill or something. I just ride their horse and I don't really. No questions asked. Much. Yeah, because most of them, they're live and they're not going to put me on a horse that's a bad horse. So in that case, this race, I didn't have anything. Um, both Victor, he rides Victor Espinosa also. So I just told him whichever jockey wanted, um, he could have. And they put Abel on him. Talk to us a little bit about Abel. Of course, he was a dominating jockey up in Northern California. And when he came down here, you guys hooked up. How did that relationship kind of start out? It started good. I mean, if you really stop and look at it with, with Abel, he's been here now three years. Um, he's won the fall meet twice at Del Mar. He tied with um, Pratt here at the fall meet for Santa Anita. Um, he won the Los Alamitos like about three or four times. Um, he's finished in the top three, basically every meet he's been at. The only bad meet he has was this fall at, at Del Mar. And um, it, it was just circumstances, but he's came back to win the title at Los Alamitos and now he's going strong here. So he's just a real consistent rider and very easy to work with. And he'll work horses in the morning. He doesn't complain. And he's just a very talented rider. And, and people like him because he tries and has some talent and he thinks in a race. And I think those are all good qualities. And he's a family man and you're kind of the surrogate grandfather to some of his uh, children as well. Well, he has, he has one son who just turned five, Abel Jr., who who is one of the smartest kids I've been around. My wife knows a lot. She's been around a lot of kids and stuff, and he's come over to the house and stuff, and she picked up on it really, really quickly that this kid's exceptionally smart. But I've seen him on the hobby horse, on the on the wooden horse uh -huh. working out. Uh -huh. He looks like a natural, so he might be my jockey in 10 years from now. Those genetics are strong in the Cedillo family, that's for sure. Let's take a look at race number two, Tom, this time on the main track, six furlongs the distance. Also, race two begins the 50 cent early pick four. This race is for $20,000 claimers, non-winners of three races lifetime. We've got a field of five and number two, Wipe the Slate, who's taking a drop down in class for your buddy, Doug O'Neill, is the seven to five morning line favorite, ridden by the bug, bug by Diego Herrera, talk to us about race two. Well, I think a lot of times you have a speed horse that like wipe the slate. Doug likes to put the bug rider, get the five pounds, and they go. Um, Braun is a good horse at Baffers. Juan Hernandez, of course, is a great rider. And um, I think those are the two horses. I'm going to go with wipe the slate just because of the drop. And um, with the bug rider, I, I think he has an advantage. But definitely Braun with Juan Hernandez is a, a great rider, um, has a big shot. 
Let's see if we can find a price in race number three. This begins the 20 cent rainbow pick six. The jackpot single ticket carryover now up to $206,000. Also race number three is part of the $1 Stronach five today. It goes as leg number two. And we kick things off one mile on the main track for maiden claiming fillies and mares. $20,000 is the claiming tag. Make the jockey a number two, Kate and Kid Juan Hernandez, a field of eight. Morning line favorite number three, Doritas Happy. Five to two on the morning line. Going from a route to a sprint. It's interesting, Tom, that four of the eight runners in here exit a common race on january 9th which was also a race for maiden twenty thousand dollar claimers going one mile you rode medusa's gaze that day you also ride her back today before we get your pick on the race i wanted to show this race because of its importance because four of the runners are exiting this field let's watch the race gate to wire and listen to the pleasant sounds of track announcer frank miramati get them around there they're in the gate and they're off Medusa's gaze, hard set, trying to show the way. Dynamite Queen on the far outside. Stoic Luna is up close. So is Renegade Princess and Queen of Love down on the inside. So it's Queen of Love who will duel with Stoic Luna around the first turn. Stoic Luna is a little bit quicker now and takes command opening up. Renegade Princess is third, already four lengths off the lead. Then Medusa's gaze racing on the inside of Dynamite Queen. At the back of the field, Roses for Maryland, Awesome Pamela, and Glory for Chrome. Down the back stretch they go, and it is Stoic Luna who has opened up almost 10 lengths. In second is Queen of Love, Renegade Princess on the outside, Medusa's Gaze in the pink, pushed along to try to get by that pair. They're followed by Roses for Maryland, Awesome Pamela, Dynamite Queen, and Glory of Chrome at the back. Still a big lead for Stoic Luna around the far turn. Three furlongs from home and an eight-length cushion. Renegade Princess now starts to cut into that margin. The lead suddenly down to four and diminishing with every stride. Medusa's gaze is also inching into contention as Stoic Luna's had enough at the top of the stretch. Renegade Princess comes through to take the lead. On the outside... Coming is Medusa's gaze. Wider out here's Glory of Chrome, who was dead last and is taking aim. They're followed by Awesome Pamela threading through traffic and Queen of Love down at the rail. A 16th to go. Medusa's gaze on the outside, just trying to get to this leader, Renegade Princess, who won't surrender. And it's Renegade Princess fighting off a host of pursuers. Awesome Pamela split rivals to complete the exacta. Then Medusa's gaze, Glory of Chrome, and they were followed by Queen of Love to complete the super high five. Tom, I hate to have you relive that torture. Medusa's gaze, as we saw, basically had every shot to go by. She's an 0 for 19 maiden. The good news is she finished a close third. The bad news is they staggered home in about 28 seconds. Keep in mind the track at that point in time of the meet was kind of favoring more of the inside placed runners than the outside placed runners. Having looked at that replay, looking at all the runners who are running today, what say you about race three? Well, have you ever heard that 20 is the lucky number? No. <laughs> uh, he, this horse is uh, tries every time, but just doesn't get there. And, and you, you got to give the horse a, you know, a lot of credit in the heart that she tries. Made $60,000 for the owner so far. Yeah. And um, this race I looked at, and I was going to go real deep in it. But then I started looking at it, and it actually has quite a bit of speed. And I, I think the two can go. I think the um, the four can go. I, I think the outside horse can go. I, I think Jessica can go on her horse. So looking at it more and more, I'm thinking let all the speed going. And the three horses that came from behind last time. Correct. The one awesome and then awesome um, Pamela, Pamela and gosh. then Glory of Chrome. To me, one of these horses are going to catch the, the leaders, and that's what I'm going with those three. The horses coming from behind, hopefully all of them go too fast in the front, on the front end. You got them surrounded here, Tom. Victor Espinoza rides Gloria, Gloria, Glory of Chrome, and as we mentioned, Medusa's Gaze, ridden by Abel Cedillo. When the jockeys get off a horse, I know you're not necessarily talking to them after every race, but do you guys kind of do a recap at the end of the day? Do they give you input? Hey, I want to ride this horse back. I think the horse should have blinkers. Like, what type of interaction do you have with your riders, either after the race or at the end of the day? Where we're going to go to dinner, what we're going to have for dinner. and um... What's your favorite restaurant around nearby? <laughs> Oh, probably Taco Bell. <laughs> but um, no, we don't really talk. If he, he'll he say something to me about a horse, um, him or Victor, that they really like and want to run back, and, or they'll have one that, you know, this horse just doesn't try. But um, 
you can watch a race and pretty much tell what's going on without talking to your job. You've had a little bit of experience doing this, right? And we haven't yeah. talked about that. But of course, you came to the races as a young man. You went to high school right across the street. And of course, you've had a lot of different jobs around the racetrack. You used to be a racing secretary as well. Now you're a jockey agent. There's not many tricks you've missed up to this point, are there? No, I've been on the track now 53 years. Unbelievable. And um, probably without having four grandkids, I'll be here another 20 years just to pay for them. So I'll be here for a while. College is expensive these days, that's for sure. Let's take a look at race number four, Tom. Again, we're sprinting on the turf course. Six furlongs in the distance, starter optional claiming types, and also race four begins the 50-cent late pick five. We've got a field of seven. Number two, Priano, who you rode last time at Los Alamitos, is the two-to-one favorite. But Abel rides number six, Swiss Swoo from the Steve Knapp Barn, one of two in here from the Knapp Barn, 12-to-one on the morning line, a type of a type of a price that we like as players. Let's first talk about Priano. Is this a case of where Flavian wasn't available over at Los Sal, you rode, and then you got booted off now, or just kind of give us no. the inside scoop? I had a call on on Glass Horse in the dirt race. There was one um, two days later that on the dirt, and Glatt was going to wait for that. And then he started that day about nine or 10 o'clock. He was afraid that the grass race, the dirt race wasn't sure. going. Yes, that's to ride the horse again, but I already given Steve Knapp a call. And I didn't want to take off Steve's horse, so he ended up getting Pratt. And he had a conditional in here. If the dirt race would have filled, then he was going to come out of here and go into the dirt race. So I think that his his horse is better on the dirt than the grass. So for that reason, I think he'll be he'll be overplayed because Pratt's on him and he won, but he can be beat. And it's interesting, Tom. I just want to kind of focus on that for a moment without getting into specific, but your job is really to manage relationships, right? You're put in a lot of difficult situations, just like what you described right now. How do you kind of manage that? I mean, what do you do when either, you know, something like that happens or, you, you know, the scenarios I'm talking about? How well, do you manage that? It depends. You know, it depends what horse you're on and who you're dealing with and stuff. There might be there's some situations you could call the person and say, listen, this horse decided to go in now and, and I got to take off. In other situations, you, you just you'd rather not because you just rather not go ahead and create that friction between the trainer. Um, the one thing is you explain to your jock what happened because naturally he looks at the overnight and he says, "Why am I, why am I on this horse?" Sure. And so you explain to him, and he he understands how it goes, how it works. So you don't like Priano on the turf necessarily, but you do like Swiss Swoo. Talk to us about why you like Swiss Swoo. Well, he's got speed, and you know, so I think the two naturally has speed, and he's going to go. But I think my horse likes the turf, so I think I'm going to be right up there on his throat latch, and I think we'll go on, and I think he'll stop, and he'll run second. I'll win it, and then we'll be on him next time. Tom talked about Priano and running on the turf course. I'll tell you some interesting statistics. First of all, the dam nor any of her foals have ever run on the turf course. So this will be the first time that uh, Priano from this particular family is trying the turf course. And you can see in the racing form, if you have it in front of you, the Mark Gladbarn is 0 for 28 with their first time turf runners. Over a five-year period, he's 10 for 128. That's 8%. And the last first time turf winner, the Mark Gladbarn, is a horse you might recall by the name of Magic at Midnight back in August of 2020 at Del Mar. We'll see if the favorite is, vulner is vulnerable in race number four. Race number five begins the 50 cent late pick four, sprinting on the main track, six and a half furlongs for fillies and mares. $12,500 is the claiming tag. A field of seven after the scratch of the two. Show it will not compete. Morning line favorite number five, Tis a Master from the Vladimir Sarin Barn, five to two on the morning line. You talked about streaks earlier, Tom. What about the Sarin Barn? They've been red hot since opening day. He definitely has been. He's 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 done a great job with his horses, and he's won with um, Juan, and he's run with DeSormo and and Maldonado. So he's he's very very spreading the wealth around. Yeah, and um, that horse is I think tough here. Just one going wire to wire went for ten thousand. Um, I think it's a it's a three horse race myself. I don't like the eight horse, the the Pratt horse. Um, I just. Think, you know, he just claimed again from Hector just claimed him. His form is kind of off. But if you look at Spar, he's very consistent. Yep. And Tyler Bays is a very, very consistent rider. Um, Tis a master and actually just won. And then I think an interesting horse is that Busy Painter, the one horse. Um, he's very consistent. And, um, and actually Cesar D'Alba does a really good job with his horses. So that's the three that I like in the race.
number one busy painter who Tom just spoke about. You can see it is taking the blinkers off today. First off the claim for uh, former quarter horse jockey Cesar Dialba. Also certainly likes the main track here at Sandy. It is seven lifetime stars, three wins and two seconds. And a statistic courtesy of Brad Free at the racing form on number eight, hot on the trail, likely to take action in this race. The Hector Palma barn. Of the last 15 horses that he has claimed, six of them have hit the winner's circle. Six of the last 15 that the Palma Barn has claimed have visited the winner's circle. Race number six, Tom, we're coming down the hillside turf course, and that's always a great uh, thing to see. Fillies and mares, allowance optional claiming types, non-winners of two other than. Field of seven, number two, Sensible Cat, who ran a great bang-up race, finishing a good second last time off off the layoff from the Carla Barn. Carla Gaines Barn is the five to two morning line favorite, but you ride a horse on the comeback trail down on the rail, number one, New Heat from the Anthony Savannah. Edra Barn, six to one on the morning line. Let's first talk about New Heat. What can you tell us about uh, about her? Well, actually, Abel's ridden the horse before, and Anthony does a really good job. He doesn't have a big stable, but he gets on his own horses, and his wife helps him in the barn and stuff. So they're a kind of family, you know, um, train um, family company that takes care of all the horses. And but this horse is going to come from way off of it. So being the one hole is not that bad. He'll be back there, and hopefully he can get in the clear and, and be flying at the end. Is there pace to set up his late kick? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. <laughs> but he's got to get lucky. Sure. Um, I think um, the Tim Yachtin horse with Pratt, I think he's the class of the race. I think he's the horse to beat. Um, I like him more than the, the two horse. Uh, but Carla does a good job with the horses, and you got Juan Hernandez again, so you, you got to take a look at it. And then Simon Callahan um, with Tyler Bays, um, that'd probably be my number one pick. I, I think he's that horse is doing well. He's got some class. Again, Tyler's a great rider. Simon does a good job. So that's my, my number one pick is the four. Number four, Spirit of Bermuda is who Tom likes best in race number six. Just a couple of additional comments. Spirit of Bermuda, last time out in her debut in Southern California, Tyler was not on her back as she was leaving the paddock. She's a bit of a quirky type of head case type of filly. Pay attention to how she's behaving in the paddock today. We'll see if she, if perhaps her manners are, are, are better mannered, so to speak. And if they are, perhaps she'll run a little bit better than last time out in New Heat, who Tom rides with Abel Cedillo. If you look at the race, uh, the racing form, you can see uh, she had a comeback race on May 20. 2nd, 2021, almost identical to this situation. It was her first off a layoff. She was coming from a route to a sprint. And as time indicated, as Tom indicated, she flew down the lane at 12 to 1 to just win by a half length. We'll see if history can repeat itself in race number six. Race number seven begins the $1 golden hour pick four. That links our last two races here at San Diego with the last two races at Golden Gate. The payouts on both Friday and Sunday last week were astronomical. 4000 on Friday, 6000 on Sunday. So definitely get involved. It's a fun wager. Higher minimum, lower takeout means better payouts. And we kick things off here for $40,000 claimers. And it's a good field of eight here with the morning line favorite taking a drop down in class number seven, Proverb. Five to two from the Richie Baltus barn. Again, Tom, we're going to take a look at a replay here. I was really impressed with Mongolian wins last effort. Abel rode him that particular day. He never gave up. So let's watch the replay of Mongolian, uh, Mongolian wind losing to American Theorem last time out. And they're off. American Theorem is going to the front. Shooter shoot along the inside. Divine Arbor moves up to take second. Secret touch. Mongolian win caught about five wide into the first turn. And who's the star will save ground into that turn? It's American Theorem, the controlling speed. Has it by a length and a half. Divine Armor is a joint second racing on the inside of Mongolian Wind, who now takes that second spot. Shooter shoot is next. At the rail, a three wide secret touch. And two and a half more to who's the star. Onto the back stretch they go. And it's American Theorem, three quarters of a length. Mongolian wind trying to apply a little bit of heat second. At the rail comes shooter shoot, divine armor, and secret touch. Those three still right across the track. And another three lengths to who's the star. At the half mile pole, Mike Smith and American Theorem in front of half length. Mongolian wins second. Shooter shoots been a little bit keyed up. He's been ready at the rail third. Then Divine Armor, secret touch just outside of him. And who's the star trying to rally while going around horses? American Theorem passes the 5 sixteenths. Starts to extend now. And American Theorem a length and a half. Who's the star continues to make progress. Shooter shoot is now called on. 
He swings off the rail for the drive. They're at the top of the stretch, and it's American Theorem of Length. Shooter shoot chasing Gamely in second. Who's the star on the outside between horses Mongolian Wind and Divine Armor at the rail? A 16th to go, and it's American Theorem holding firm on the front end. American Theorem, coast to coast. Shooter shoot second, Divine Armor third, then Mongolian Wind. Tom, I was mistaken. That was your other jock, Victor Espinosa in the saddle. But what I liked most about Mongolian Wind's effort is that basically on the turn, uh, he looked beat, but he never gave up. He battled all the way to the wire. He was basically right there against some really nice horses. Now takes a drop down in class. What do you think of Mongolian Wind's chances in race number seven? Yeah, again, I agree with you. He kept trying. Victor kept trying on him. He didn't let up on him. Um, I thought maybe Victor would be riding him back, but um, the, the, that Mark Ladder, the owners, wanted um, Abel, so um, I didn't argue with him on it. But I think this horse is my number one bet of the whole day. Of course. Uh, I, I think he's the best horse in the race. Proverb, Proverb is a class dropper. Again, you got Pratt. Baltus is a great trainer. But um, I think my horse is the one to, to, to beat this day. Proverb, as you can see, two races back on October 2nd, finished a good third to eight rings. That race would obviously be very tough to beat in this field. And one final statistic, courtesy of Brad Free at the Racing Forum. Over the last three years, whenever uh, whenever Richie Baltus and Flavian Pratt have teamed up as favorites in dirt route races, 12 times that's happened, five wins, five seconds, and one third. 11 for 12 in the money whenever they go, whenever they have a favorite going on going in a dirt route race we close out the card time in race number eight six and a half furlongs in the turf course and also race eight is the first leg of the five dollar golden hour daily double similar concept last leg at san Anita with the last race at golden gate main special weight cal bread three-year-old fillies a really good field of eight here i think this might be the best betting race on the card Ute number five second time starter from the cliff size barn is five to two on the morning line favorite again i don't want to torture you and create any more agony but i did want to look at the replay tom for number seven swanning who was first time turf last time out going two turns what a bad beat this was but let's watch the replay and see what you think afterwards All in. And they're off. Quick start for Swanning in the center of the course. Square Fun has speed too. And now Square Fun takes the lead. Prescott presses from the inside. Swanning now a joint third on the outside of La Deuxième Etoile, who's a little bit headstrong. That's an understatement. She goes three wide after the top pair. It's another three, back to Addy Did It, who's down on the fence, five lengths off the lead. Two more lengths comes Emerald Lake, racing on the outside of Bonnie Bray, who's covered up at this stage, about nine lengths off the pacemakers. Warren Showgirl and Lover's Odyssey is at the back of the field. It's square fun on the outside, and Prescott, stride for stride. Two more to La Deuxième Etoile in third. Another two, back to Swanning, down at the rail in fourth, only three lengths off the lead. Now then to Addy Did It, followed at the rail by Bonnie Bray, who has some breathing room, starts to make some headway down at the rail. Emerald Lake, Lover's Odyssey, and Warren Showgirl. Around the far turn, the Dizzy Amitois could wait no longer, pounces on the top pair, takes the lead. She'll be immediately tackled by Swanning. These two arrive at the quarter pole, one, two. Square Fun is in third. Prescott drops out of it. They're at the top of the stretch. Swanning in the center. La Deuxième Etoile head and head. Four lengths back. Emerald Lake is finishing very nicely. And Emerald Lake moving into third at a swift pace. Has to get to Swanning in the final stages. Swanning, La Deuxième Etoile, and Emerald Lake bearing down. Emerald Lake wins at first asking. Perfectly timed by Johnny V. Swanning in a photo with La Deuxième Etoile. It was another photo behind them for the other minor awards. Among them, Bonnie Bray, Addy did it in Lover's Odd. Tom, it's like a torture chamber up here. I keep showing bad beat after bad beat. That was the definition of a bad beat. You got beat by a Peter Miller, Ruben Alvarado, first-time starter, ridden by Johnny V. Man, it's a tough game sometimes. Yeah, I think that's one of those situations where – the two horses that were on the lead, battling lead, were long shots. And so I think Abel wanted not to go ahead and go head and head with them. And you could see Abel had a lot of horse. So he did I nothing think, wrong. He, yeah. sat, he sat in the pocket, yeah. swung wide. So I think, I think with, I really like when Doug drops from a mile to six and a half. Um, 
it it he he that's a pretty good record for him i think i don't know look the numbers are but you got a fit horse you can see that he had a lot of horse on the backside, so i think six and a half will be a perfect distance for him i think he'll be double tough here size horse again with juan hernandez got off a slow start and closed a lot of ground um so those probably are the two horses but i'll go with swanee and take note, there's three runners in this race. Race number eight, sired by Danza Candy. Sweet California mix and match, and uh, the, probably the post-time favorite, number five, Ute. Tom, want to thank you so much for your time and insight today. You're a credit to the game. Want to wish you nothing but uh, success and good luck, not only today, but for the remainder of the year. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Thanks to all of you for watching as well. Have fun today, everybody. Make some money, and good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our national anthem.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Santa Anita Park. Here are the changes. The track is fast and our turf is firm. Rail on the turf, out 30 feet. In the first, we have a blinker note for number one, as always, listed on the bottom of the program page. First race starts the early pick five. The second starts the early pick four with a blinker note. In the third, rainbow pick six, 206,000 in the jackpot pool for a single ticket winner. Number two, Kate and Kid, the jockey Juan Hernandez. Wave the bug, the weight 126. In the fourth, late pick five begins. No changes. Fifth race, start of the late pick four, scratch two, show it. Note that number four, discreet Stevie B, three pounds over. In the sixth race, no changes. Seventh starts the Golden Hour Pick Four. Blinker note. Eighth race Golden Hour Double begins with a blinker note. Enjoy your day at Santa Anita Park. They'll be at the gate for the opener in 26 minutes at 1230.
12 as they roll into the backstretch. With the Pegasus World Cup on Saturday at Gulfstream Park, something to warm you folks up. On Friday, the 28th of January, we have the all-star ticket for the Stronach 5. A great wager, an industry-low 12% takeout. Here's our all-star ticket for $108. It starts at Laurel Park, two races from Santa Anita. I mentioned Gulfstream Park. Golden Gate as well in the mix. And again, a cost of $108. Best of luck if you are playing the all-star ticket.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Stronic Group, we'd like to welcome you to the kickoff Friday in our three-day weekend here at beautiful Santa Anita Park. Peter Lurie alongside my partner, Michelle Yu. Michelle, great dress choice. We're ready for winners. Oh, thank you, Pete. I appreciate it. I was hot today, so I couldn't wear my sweater. Felt fancy. Let's talk about a work. This from our partners over at XBTV. Can 